the seventh seal. That's right, folks. We are kicking off October with what I would honestly say is the most terrifying film I have ever seen in my life. This movie is every single part of dread I feel every single day, every single minute, every waking moment of my life. That's what this movie is. This is also one of my favorite movies ever made. And much like some of my other favorite movies we've talked about, Casablanca, His Girl Friday, I don't know how I want to go about talking about this because it's a film that is constantly on my mind, a film that means so much to me, that is talking about stuff and doing stuff I want to talk about and experience and feel and create. And this movie just ah, just makes me feel things I don't want to feel sometimes, and I appreciate it for doing that, for going to those places. It's incredible. It's Igmar Berman, and we haven't talked about him yet on the channel. Don't know why we would. This is kind of like the one you'd want to talk about, and if we haven't talked about this one, we're not going to talk about the other ones. We'll get there eventually. But he is just a really good filmmaker. Somebody who is so good at capturing human emotion. And that is like the the forefront of everything he does. Is humans are people and we exist in this world. And we just live in this energy in this specific moment. And it makes us feel stuff. And that can be off-putting to some people just like living in the naturalistic world around us while having these terrifying and horrific elements that just want us to think and feel and see what the world is he is a guy who is definitely afraid of death and, and this is a movie that is about a man who is coping with mortality and that's my favorite type of movie this film deals with some of my favorite subjects to talk about which is mortality and religion and how the two coexist can you find peace in your life given what you know about god or what you don't know about god or what you're willing to accept about god it's really cool and the backdrop that this movie plays with is the perfect time period to explore those types of themes it's the crusades which are on the out they're kind of ending and a plague is sweeping across the nation two things where there is mass death and for different reasons. Are you going into battle to kill these people because of God for like this holy crusade that you were sent upon? And then just like a random plague that is killing innocents of lives. And man, is it disturbing and just really plays with those feelings. This movie messes me up every time I watch it. I cannot sit there and not just go, oh God, what are we really doing? And not just about like what the film's presenting, just about life itself. And we don't have to get into like the existential dread of existence. But we might a little bit because that's what this movie wants to play with. It also just wants to show you how nihilistic everything around you can be. And you should hold on to the small moments that feel real and whole and loving. Which is, I guess, the best thing you can do when you're afraid of everything around you and everything that's going to lead to your downfall. So this movie is following a knight as he comes back from his crusade and it is following his squire. It's the two of them going on this journey back to the knight's home where he is potentially going to see his wife. He left her when they were like newlyweds and he wants to see if she's still alive. And along the way, he gets into chess matches with death. And you are so familiar with the depiction of death and the iconic shots involving that character. I feel there's no need to say it or to hark on it any longer. It is one of the most iconic moments and iconic designs in all of film. It is perfect, flawless, executed great, and it's the type of thing I love to see. Somebody thinking they can outsmart death, but the ultimate goal of death in this film is to remind you they're always going to win. You cannot beat something that is inevitable, and that is really powerful stuff. It's the best look of death. It's my favorite interpretation of death because it is just a force of nature, but also just willing to take you on the journey so you discover it yourself, which is really cool to see. This knight is just, as soon as we see him, he's fighting death and he's like, well, let's prolong the game as long as we can. Maybe I will find something worth living for or whatever. They go on their merry way. It's a road trip story, but it's also just like a human interest story. We just follow people in their everyday lives as they exist and breathe here's an acting troupe two of them are married he's like an acrobat and a juggler she sings the person they're with doesn't like to like wear masks or anything he wants to be like a real actor and stuff but he can't do that when he has to perform in these like weird ceremonies and whatever that 
become the talk of the town. Those are the things people like. That is like our other core group. It is Joff and Mia. They are like the married couple who... I think they're the heart of the movie. You know, Joff is kind of a guy who lives in the world of fantasy. He can see the things around him. When we're introduced to him, he sees the Virgin Mary walking a baby. He's one of the few characters that can see death, who is always aware of their presence because he he lives in both worlds, which is kind of what's saying. He's a man who's on the outs his entire life, which is really fun to see. So those are our characters. They're eventually going to meet up with our knight and our squire. They'll have to get there eventually. We should just say it because it's important, but it's also so unimportant to talking about this film because it's one of the greatest films ever made. It looks incredible. One of the best looking pieces of cinema ever put to film. I love every inch of this movie. Ingmar knows how to frame his pictures. He knows where he wants people to stand. He knows what's in the foreground, what's in the background, how to make you uncomfortable and uneasy through all of it. And my God, is it just so powerful to see that. I love it so much. Every time there's like bright eyes just staring directly down the lens. Every time a character just delivers a heartbreaking line and we slowly like pan to see like what the town is seeing or what everyone's feeling in a moment. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. I don't know how deep we're going to get into a lot of this. There are certain things I want to spend some time talking about. We meet a painter and he kind of like reveals like the plague and what's happening to everybody around them as they exit the uh, church where the painter is painting. We meet a young woman who's going to be burned for worshiping the devil and being like incommunicado with the devil. And that is the first inclination that our knight is having a crisis of fate. Now, when you go to a crusade and you do 10 years of hard labor fighting for something, you're going to lose what you're fighting for. That is a guarantee. That happens to the knight and happens to the squire. What happens to the knight is he has lost his faith and he wants to find it again. He wants reassurance that everything he did with his life means something. And God, does that get really personal? I guess we could talk about his story. It is the most important one. I don't think he's the central focus, though, but it's Max von Sydow. Very young. Looks like he's been through hell and back, but this is a young guy still. And he is a man who is going to die. He is aware he's going to die. He wants to prolong he wants to prolong it as long as he can, but there's nothing you can do. The end is coming for you. And every chance he gets to like learn something about what any of it means. When they're in the church and he is just like having his crisis of like I lost God. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Everything is around me is bad. I don't like the person I am or what I've become. I'm lost and I'm broken and I'm scared. And you just have two of the main guys both completely broken and unable to be fixed, going in completely different directions with their journeys. The knight is afraid of death. He only wants to know what's coming next, so there's some reassurance in what's already waiting for him. There are sequences where he's begging, like, I just want to know, if you're talking to the devil, you have to tell me what is waiting for me. I need to know. And then you have the squire, whose name is Jones or Johns or whatever you want to say. He is a broken man in the way that everything around him is futile. Like he is, he's not searching for like some answer. He's like, there's nothing. We did 10 years of the Crusades. I probably lost my wife in that time to the plague. I'm not even going to bother looking for her. There's nothing left for me. He saves a woman from being raped and he's like, I guess I could use you to like tend to my clothes if they're dirty. I don't really care. He is a, he's so broken and it's in such a different way because he's, he's the communicative one of the two of them. He's going to talk to everybody and have them learn lessons. But I really like that he's just a different type of broken, somebody so sure of what the world has to offer and that there's nothing there left to see. Nihilistic till the end. So we eventually all like meet up in the same town. We see like the production that the acting troupe is putting on and it is interrupted by a bunch of people who have the plague just showing up and like telling the townspeople like you are all going to hell because that's what we're doing here. We're all going to die. It's futile. Just a terrible sequence of sick and like dirty people whipping themselves walking into this location every one of our main characters is like looking on like this is what's awaiting us there's nothing left we can do to escape this is there that leads to the other member of the acting troupe whose name is scott or scat whatever you want to say 
he sneaks off with Lisa. She is the wife of the blacksmith. And they go away. And then it comes to an altercation in a bar where Joff is accused of helping Lisa sneak away. So her husband, the blacksmith, is like, I'm going to kill you for letting my wife leave me. And it is just another one of those like harrowing scenes. It's not like an existential scene of just like, what are we fighting for? What are we? What is our life about? It's a scene where everybody in a room is making fun of a guy who has done nothing wrong because he is doing something different than what's expected of a man of his like status, I guess. So they make him dance or they're going to kill him. And it's just terrifying. And that's when Johns comes in to save him. And he's just like, what are we doing here? Why are you hurting this guy? He's useless and harmless. It's a terrifying sequence. And I, I just love it so much. It just makes me so uncomfortable. I go, ugh, that's a nightmare. That's nightmare. That's stuff I think about just being told to perform because that's what people expect of you. That is happening at the same time, a sequence where the knight is meeting with Mia and they're sitting down just talking about like sorrow and how sad they are about the world around them and how she can relate to that and she wants a better future for her son, one that may never come for her or for her son. And then that leads to one of my favorite sequences, which is just all of our main characters sitting down at a like, I think it's just like a tablecloth that they put on the ground or something eating from a bowl of strawberries and the night just being I'll try to remember this this is a happy moment you know I got to see a beautiful child I got to hear a nice song I got to spend time with people this is something I'll try to remember and then he goes to play with death again and it leads him to realize there's no way that he can prolong this anymore it's going to come. He tries to get the troop to come with them through the forest. They can stop at his place before they head on like their merry way down further into the chaos that is the plague. This movie is 96 minutes, by the way. I don't know if I made that clear. We are dealing with the most heavy, burdening shit in the span of 96 minutes. And I'm just supposed to walk away from that? No way. I can't. I won't. I haven't. I'm still coping with it. This, like... The films that I love, like Casablanca, His Girl Friday, they are films I can watch endlessly over and over again at any point in my life. But this one, which I do put in like my top 15 films, I can't watch it all the time. It just scares me to no end. It makes me uncomfortable. And we're kind of building up to like a key scene for me. Uh, before we get there, you know, the actor who ran away with like the blacksmith's wife, they return, he chases him. They learn like a lesson because everyone starts to go on like this journey to going to the knight's house. So the, the actor, Scott, he fakes his death and then he like climbs into a tree to evade being like seen by everybody. And that's when death shows up with a saw to cut down the tree to actually kill him. And he's like, there's no excuses. There's no exclusions. Like this is going to be it for me. And death just goes, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> So then they continue down through their trails headed deeper into the forest and we pass the woman who's going to be burned. She's captured by some more priests and some knights and they go to where they're going to burn her, which is, in my opinion, the most crucial scene and exactly what Ingmar Berman has been trying to say about this entire thing, about life, okay? The moment you are faced with death, there is nothing left to see. There's nothing waiting for you. It is empty. Oh, it is such a good sequence because the knight is trying to talk to her like you were in communication with the devil. Where is he? What did he say to you? She's like, I know I'm going to be okay. I just feel it. he's like, I don't care if you feel it. Did he say something to you? And he knows like, well, I can't have any reassurance from that. All of this holy crusade I went on, this woman who says she talked to the devil, I don't have any reassurance from any of that. That's not helping me. So what is going to help him? It's hard to say. If there's anything that could, it's not this situation. So then they hang the woman up. She's like on a ladder or something. And I love like this. Oh, it's so scary and so real. Just watching the knight and the squire watch her burn. And the squire just goes, who do you think is watching her? Is it God? Is it Satan? Is it death himself? No. No one is watching her. Nothing is there. What she is looking back at is the realization that nothing awaits her. 
it's just emptiness, you know? Oh, <laughs> that is terrifying. I love that sequence. Just looking at this woman, having the horrific vision, like, oh, the devil's not coming to save me. I'm just going to burn to death. And I might not feel any pain, but this is where I die. That is terrifying. It's echoed further where there's a sequence later on in their travels when they head deeper into the forest. And this guy who has the plague shows up and he's like, won't somebody help me? Don't you have any compassion? I'm just going to die here. This is how I die. And everyone's just looking on. And that is just, that's the key to this too. It's just so much around you is happening. You can't stop death. Death will always be around you. It's always going to be a factor, no matter what you attempt or try to do. Oh God. And you just echo that with the sentiments of like, has God forsaking me, leaving me with this sorrow and despair? Why has God like made my wife run away from this? Why has God taken our land? Why has God left us in a worse world for our son? Our son should have a future. Is he going to have a future as strong as that? Is there a future as strong as that? It is so beautiful. And God, it's just, I don't know how much to say because it, it breaks me to really like go deep into a movie like this that is just so clearly nihilistic and afraid of itself, afraid of existence and feeling and learning that there's nothing waiting for you. It's so terrifying. And and look, if you are somebody who thinks there is an afterlife or wants to believe there is something like that, I'm not going to stop you. But the point of this movie is, and we see that in like the final sequence of chess that the knight is playing with it with death, is there is no secret to learn. There is no riddle to solve. When your time comes, your time comes, and that's it. And some people will accept that. Others won't. And in either of those moments, there is something terrifying waiting for you. And that leads us to the final sequence of the film, which is us going to the knight's house. And we meet his wife and she's like, man, we were so young when we met. Now look at us so aged. Two people who are hardened by the world around them and we never got to experience our lives together. It is so devastating. So devastating. And they sit down for a meal and she reveals like the seventh seal, like the, the scripture about the seventh seal. And that's when everyone is going to die. And we're going to see them all be carried away through the hills as our acting troupe of Mia and Joff watch on because they, they left later when we saw Joff was able to see the final chess game being played. It's so good. It's so good. I love the long shots. Like there's so many just long shots and continuous shots that we hold on of just watching people's faces. And that final one at the end, they've all been great up to that point, but the final one at the end where we hold on the shot of the one woman who hasn't said a word the entire film, who joined the squire because he saved her life. She is so broken looking at this thing, almost like she's been seeing death the entire time. And she's like, it's finished. Like not a question not worried just like that's it my hardship is over i get to die almost in like a peaceful way where it's like this is the peace i can feel after everything i've done it's amazing and everyone introduces themselves to death and you see in the background that the knight is praying because the time has come he has not accepted that there's nothing waiting for him he's accepted he's going to die but not that there's nothing waiting for him which is just crazy. It's so powerful. And I love that. And I, I, I think it's a very important film for young filmmakers or young film fans to watch because this is so much of what you know. It comes from the visuals, the storytelling, the pacing, the setup of characters, introducing characters throughout in all these different ways. It comes from this. Bergman is a guy that people love to homage and aspire to be. This is the type of film that you need to watch because it has something to say and it's going to leave you feeling something that's not very good, <laughs> but that is important sometimes. And the dread of existence is great. The story of the night is everything I feel all the time. What's waiting for us? Is there anything waiting for us? What is it? Is it a religious thing waiting for me? Is it just nihilism waiting for me? I don't know. And that is just so well depicted through this beautiful black and white movie about a knight playing chess with death and trying to cheat his way out of his inevitability. The seventh seal is incredible. 
a fantastic film that gets better as you get older because you understand what it's doing more and more. And I haven't seen it in a long time. Coming back to watch it for this episode, it broke me all the same. And I think that's an important thing to have in film. Something that really wrecks you but means so much to you. And that's what this is to me. So that's why it's the scariest film I've ever seen. Because I think about this stuff too much <laughs> for a normal person. <laughs> Thank you all for watching this episode. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. As always, you can check me out on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And of course, I will catch you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck.